Well, I'm just finishing a book uh, entitled China Goes Global, uh, which uh, really looks at various dimensions of China's uh, presence and impact uh, on the international scene in many different dimensions. 30 years ago, uh, China had no international presence or impact, I would argue. Uh, they were just beginning their economic reforms, um, which have been driven by trade export-based uh, growth strategies. So now we all, of course, uh, know and buy Chinese products on a daily basis, it seems like. But 30 years ago, uh, China didn't have a global trade profile at all. Um, certainly didn't have a military profile, didn't really have much of a diplomatic profile. It had only been admitted recently to the United Nations. Uh, China was just coming out 30 years ago of its um, so-called Cultural Revolution uh, period and 25, 30 years of an autarkic uh, kind of strategy um, that under Mao. So compared to then, China has completely transformed domestically and it's grown in its international presence substantially as well. Well, I think if you look at China's uh, global um, presence and China's global power, um, Carefully, one uh, is a bit surprised, or at least I'm surprised, at um, the relative lack of influence and power. One would assume, given how much China's in the media and we know China's activities in various parts of the planet, you know, that it's um, a, a really significant power on order, perhaps with the United States or, or closing in on the United States. But I have found in my research in my book that not to be the case, which is why I call it a partial power. Um, in many different areas, whether you look at the economic area, the military area, the cultural area, the so-called soft power area, diplomatic area, um, or other dimensions, um, China uh, has increased its activities and its presence over the last three decades. So there's a kind of breadth to their presence around the world, but I would say it's not very deep. Um, and they're not really influencing the outcome of events, most importantly. You don't see the Chinese in the middle of trying to solve any, any major global problem, I would argue. In fact, they contribute to several major global problems. <laughs> um, and you can go through different indices, um, but I'm, I must say that I've been a bit surprised. Um, there are some exceptions to the rule. You know, their presence in Africa is greater than Latin America. You know, their economic power is certainly greater than their military power. Uh, they don't have a lot of soft power. Their diplomatic power, uh, I, I don't think they really have much. They're very risk averse and passive. You know, they're not, as I say, they're not in the middle of trying to solve any, any um, global problems. So um, that's why I call them a partial power. Well, the soft power, according to Professor Joseph Nye at Harvard University, who's the uh, credited with being the father of the concept, um, is the ability of a country to uh, co-opt other countries uh, through appeal. Uh, to get others to want what you want, is what Nye uh, calls it. Um, and the appeal comes intrinsically from a country's society. Um, its values, its traditions, its culture, uh, high culture, popular culture, its educational system, uh, its intellectual life, uh, and its political system, and even its foreign policy. So the, these elements together are kind of magnetic. They attract others to it. So countries that have soft power uh, res have respect of others, and others will seek to emulate and be attracted to those uh, countries. So by that, those criteria, uh, China does not have soft power. No country seems to be attracted uh, to China. Nobody wants Chinese political, political system. Uh, the world has respect for China's 5,000 years of, of civilization and history and traditions. is certainly considered one of the world's great uh, civilizations along with Persia and, and um, Europe. Um, but beyond that, in contemporary terms, there's not a lot in Chinese culture that resonates outside of China. Chinese literature is beginning to gain some popularity in translation. Chinese films, again, in recent years, some of them uh, beginning to gain popularity and, and some traction. Um, but uh, Chinese, other elements of Chinese society and values, um, you know, and the Chinese record of human rights is not particularly attractive. You don't see people, let me put it this way, you don't see people seeking asylum in China. People don't want to go to China. Other countries don't, other countries respect what China has done economically, 
they love to know what the secret of that economic success is, but if you look at the economic model of China, it's not transferable and exportable outside of China. It's some very peculiar conditions that only China was able to master. So um, China has um, put a lot of effort into improving its soft power into the government um, efforts to um, raise China's international profile in various media. But I would argue that that's not soft power, that's public diplomacy. It's a form of propaganda, frankly, sophisticated propaganda. But soft power, as I say, and Joseph Professor Nye says, comes intrinsically from a society, um, and, and others are attracted to it. China's a uh, long way from that. You don't see other countries, even in Asia, uh, much less outside of Asia, uh, wanting to be attracted to China. Yes, they work with China. That's a different calculation. That's a rational calculation. But I would argue in soft power terms, they're not very magnetic. Well, the question is often asked, you know, how uh, is China a responsible global actor, uh, given its size uh, and its position in the international system? Um, again, I would argue that it is a partial power. And I would argue it is not carrying its proportionate weight in the international community. Uh, if a number of aspects you can look at um, to measure that. You know, take UN operating budget, contributions to the United Nations operating budget. China is the world's second largest economy. It is, I think, number nine in terms of contributions to the uh, UN. Um, UN peacekeeping operations is considered another measure of global contributions. Uh, China has done this. It's to its credit. It contributes more personnel than any other member of the Security Council, um, but they rank number 14 or 17, I think, uh, in terms of other in terms of countries that contribute personnel to UN peacekeeping operations. Even small places like Bangladesh and Denmark and Pakistan uh, contribute more than China. Um, you know, you can go through many other areas. Climate change, um, they have a very mixed record at best. Um, they're doing some good things, I would argue, in um, organized, fighting organized crime, uh, anti-piracy operations, um, even peacekeeping forces. Uh, you know, this, these are good, useful contributions, but the question is whether they're at the level that they should be given China's size and weight and uh, place in the world order. And I argue it's not. They're punching below their weight. They're not punching at their weight or above their weight. Australia does more in international security than China does. Uh, many European countries do. So I think the Chinese are very kind of risk averse. Um, they're not very comfortable with the notion of global governance, either philosophically or practically. Uh, they don't really want to get involved in all this, but they know that, they, that there's an image cost if they don't get involved. So they do kind of minimal things. Um, to be seen as a good global citizen, but I would call them a minimal good global citizen rather than a full citizen, you know. We should ask more of China. You know, I've been very intrigued uh, visiting Australia and the ANU, uh, this visit and previous visits to follow this uh, domestic dis discourse and debate about China and the United States in Australian foreign policy. Frankly, there is no choice. Um, the United States is a much better partner and ally uh, for Australia than China would ever be. Um, there is no choice. China wants to buy Australian iron ore. End of story. <laughs> you know, that doesn't make for an ally or for a partner. It makes for a trading partner. And even depending on iron ore um, discoveries in other parts of the world, West Africa, even in China itself, uh, that is going to fluctuate over time. Values. You know, does China, do China and Australia share an intrinsic set of values? Do they sh share the same vision of world order? Do they share the same vision of Asian order? Um, do they share the same sense of human rights? Do they share the same, uh, you go, the list can go on. Frankly, I don't think there's a choice to be made. I think Australians are a little delusional, frankly, to think that there is, that they're somehow trying to navigate between these two big countries. Um, they're not mutually exclusive, first of all. You can have China as your largest trading partner, and you can have the United States as your m strategic military ally, but I would argue it goes much deeper than that. It goes into values, way of life, history, uh, preferences for world and regional order. There, there's no choice. I don't see any convergence, none, between Australian and Chinese visions 
of world and regional order. So uh, I've been kind of perplexed at the debates uh, in Australia. I've been intrigued to listen to them, watch them, but you know, if I was an Australian, uh, it's what Americans call a no-brainer. You know, the United States is a natural partner and ally. Uh, China is a temporary trade partner, or maybe not temporary, maybe long term, but uh, it's a partial partner, I would say. It's not a comprehensive partner.